going to come up and do some worship. She said, do I need to put my shoes on? I said, no, you're on holy ground. Praise the Lord. But anyways, I don't know what they're going to say, but uh, after that, they're going to come back and we'll get Lexi and the girls up here and see what they want to do.
We know them by, by their fruits. We see them, what they do in their life. They're following Jesus. And we aren't going to dictate, you do this, you do that. We're not going to do that here. We're never going to start that. But uh, we're thankful for them. And next Thursday night, now this is the first for us or uh, anything I've heard. Her, Tina uh, Hawk at um, the ministry, what, uh, New, New Hearts New Ministry. Are. Her and her son is going to give a testimony next week. Yeah. But you know what? Hey, we're all about it. Yeah. You know, because we're all in. Yeah. We're all in. So, Lexi, y'all come do whatever you're going to do, and we appreciate y'all. God bless you. by the power of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So at the home, we do not see ourselves as a facility. We see ourselves as family. And on this stage, our sisters. Amen. Sisters for life. We've seen each other at our worst, and we're going to see each other at our best. Amen. Amen. So tonight, we have come from Conway. Not all of us are here. We may be small in number, but we are mighty in heart. Yes. Yes. And these uh, women would like to share their heart for however long that they see fit. I asked them, I said, where were you before Jesus? Where are you now? And where are you going? So I am super excited to hear their hearts as well. So if you guys will just support them. For some of them, this is their first time to ever do something like this.
just so ashamed of what I've become. But since I've got there, I've only been there for about three weeks, but I'm eagerly learning every day. Every single day, it's like you wake up just ready to, to just get something else, you know? And if it wasn't for the program and for these girls, like, I know that I would not have grown so much just in three weeks. And so, like, I'm so excited for three months and, then, you know, even farther. So, anyway. Okay, so a couple days ago, my brother was actually murdered. And um, so that was like, that was a real, you know, a big thing. And everyone was so afraid that like I was gonna turn my back on God and on, on Harvard and, and on myself, you know, but I, came, I went to the hospital, you know, and we did all that jazz. And um, I came back immediately the same night, like after we, you know, let my brother go. Then I came back immediately because I knew that if I went home, that it, I was just gonna do the most, I knew that. So um, even the next day, like I tried to like make up excuses, like I need to be at home with my family, which I do. But then, you know, the Holy Spirit, he said, Jessica, you need to really question your motives. You know, like, are you really going home to be with your family? Are you going home to, to mess up? Come on, so, come on. <laughs> yeah, and have a good excuse and get away with it. But um, I didn't, you know, I stayed. And like I say again, if it wasn't for these girls, and, like all the support and love that you get at the Harvard home, I Amen. would have messed up. So we're, I'm here and we're going to have the funeral next week and all of my sisters are coming with me. And I'm Amen. So Amen. Amen. I'm still here and I'm saved and I just want to say thank you all for letting me here tonight. Amen. Hi, I'm Michelle, I'm 29, I'm from Hot Springs. I have a three-year-old little boy. Um, before God, I was held captive by drugs and alcohol and coming to the harbor I've been set free and Amen. I'll be transitioning into phase two in a few weeks.
and she was like, you seek his kingdom first, Jenna. That's all you do. You just seek his kingdom first, and all in his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And I have lived by that verse that's going into the heart. Amen. And in everything I do, I seek his will. And in everything I do, I ask, I ask him about it. I talk to him about it. And um, ever since then, man, I have... I'm, 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 Jenna is her best self in Christ, and that is what I know. What I know that today. to share our ministry story. I know that there are a lot of people in here that are ministry leaders. So it was about four and a half years ago that the Harbor Home was actually called Servants Chapel General Baptist Church. We're just a little church on an industrial road right on the edge of Conway. And we had 13 members left, and our pastor and his and his new wife felt led to help women that were broken and struggling with addiction. Uh, Miss Dana, our pastor's wife, already had a ministry prison where she was, I'm sorry, yes, a, a prison ministry, right? <laughs> and she was going into different prisons. That's funny. Uh, it was called Isaiah 3018. And uh, anyways, she just had this heart to just uh, to go after women before they ended up there or after. Amen. And so did Pastor Larry Ward. Uh, Pastor Larry Ward actually was uh, mentored by Roy Dell Clark back here. It's really cool that like, he's one of our forefathers and everything that he's poured into Pastor Larry, Pastor Larry has poured into us. Amen. And um, Anyways, so they approached these 13 members who were very elderly and looking towards the end of their lives, and they said, how do you feel about changing this church into a residential recovery home for women? And all 13 hey. voted unanimously. Yeah, hey, right? the hard way. I say we. I was one of the ones that taught them to find things out the hard way. But, um, you know, we, we just have our same old ministry story just like everyone else. And, and we stand today. We're able to house up to 18 women at a time. We have 10 beds in phase one. 10 beds in phase one and eight beds in phase two. Our phase two is a mobile home that was donated from Centennial Bank about three years ago. So I am the phase two director. And after six months, women are able to apply to get into the Phase 2 program, which is where we help you find a job, we help you get on your feet, and you are also uh, taught a whole new curriculum on Mondays, which has to do with finance and budgeting, Roydell, as well as a safe people class. How many of us know those relationships can pull us down? Yes, as well as just new biblical principles and things of that sort, just to really apply everything that you've learned in those past six months. So Jenna is in Phase 2 and I'm planning on most of these lovely ladies here to be with us as well in phase two. And we, uh, we're we just having a ball, y'all. And uh, yes, so it is an awesome opportunity. It's an awesome honor for me to be able to be a, be a part of this ministry full time. We also have our precious destiny with us today here at the table as well. heard of our program director, Laura Lise Hodges Shattuck, so that's also another one of my bosses. But guys, this is us. Amen? All right, thank you, girls. So I'm going to do my turn. Hi, my name is Lexi, and I'm 25 years old. I am God's daughter, and that is the highest part of my identity that I walk in today. I arrived at the Harbor Home about three and a half years ago. I was somewhat still convinced that I didn't have a problem. I thought the cops were the problem. I thought my mom was the problem, and you were probably the problem. But I soon found out that I had issues and that I needed to be touched by God. Amen. Amen. Well. I had been in different secular rehabs. I had even been in different psychiatric treatment facilities. I was diagnosed at 11 to be mentally unstable, and that was when the doctor put me on uh, prescription medications in order to stabilize me with my horrific anxiety at the time. Those prescriptions then led to more prescriptions, and those prescriptions led to more, and those led to the streets, and, the, and those drugs led to drug dealers. And before I knew it, I had fallen on my face and lost everything I had. 
everything in between that, of course, there's a story behind all of it. How many of us know that life happens? Yeah. Yes. Amen. Life happens. And um, there are things that will touch us as we walk through life. There are things that will touch our hearts that will put us on our knees. And if we're not careful, we won't get back up. Right. Um, that happened to me several times growing up. I believe that our heart is a home and someone's always supposed to live there. The Bible says that actually uh, God lives in our hearts That's right. and that our hearts are his home. Amen. But at eight years old, I believe that fear stepped into my heart and began to live there. And that combined with the chaotic home life that I had, my parents, they just really couldn't get along. They loved each other and they took care of me. I had everything that I ever wanted, everything that I ever needed, but we just couldn't find harmony at home. We didn't have the Lord in our life, and they often fought, and little did I know that uh, my mom herself would struggle at times. So that would continue to build and build, and Lexi was always the one that felt the need to hold everything together as far as the peacemaker and things of that sort. And as a kid, it would just break me, just the, just the chaos at home. And then it was at 15 that I found out that, um, that my dad was diagnosed with, with cancer. And within, uh, within a short amount of time, he passed away. He lost his life. And our whole world was turned upside down. To this day, I miss my dad. We all miss our family that we have lost. Amen. It was very hard to watch my father lose his body from the chemo and radiation. He physically lost himself and turned gray. That was devastating. But what was even more tragic was watching my mother lose her mind after we lost him. And I wanted to help my mom so bad, but I couldn't. I was helpless, as we are at 16. And I threw my hands in the air, and in my heart, I just said, forget it. And I started to rebel. And I sought out anything that I could try. I was curious, and I was rebellious, and I didn't care at that point. And those things led me to marijuana. Those things led me to Xanax, Percocet, Valium. Those things led me to hydrocodone. Those things led me to Roxy's. Those things led me to parties and drug dealers and drug dealers that wanted to be my boyfriend. Those things led me to money and more nice things. And I actually had everything that I could ever want. I had a full ride scholarship. I was in the x-ray program at Arkansas State University. I was a Chi Omega. I paid my bills and I made straight A's. But I would go home at night and I would live a secret dark life that was killing me. To the point that I tried to take my life in my dorm room in 2014. <coughs> and in Arkansas, you may not know this, but when you try to kill yourself and they take you to the hospital, if you don't succeed, you get court ordered to a psych ward. Yeah. Amen. Anyone been there? I've been there twice. And they took me there, and guess what they did? They put me on more meds. Yes. So I just, I was like a walking zombie, and I, I was so broken. Not to take it lightheartedly, y'all, I was messed up. I was messed up. And I didn't know who Lexi was. And I was desperate for something more. And praise God, my mom, the Lord began to touch my mom's life. And she knew that she needed to help me. And through a series of a whole bunch of crazy stories that I'm sure each one of you have probably lived out at some point as well, my mom brought me to the Harbor Home for Women, and she dropped me off and said, deuces. <laughs> the whole time I went there, and you know, of course, the whole time we're going there, I'm like, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. Don't call me, don't visit me, I hate you. Little did I know that that was exactly where I needed to be. Amen. And I look back, and I'm so thankful that I got caught. I was always the one that got caught. I was 21 years old looking at going to prison. Somehow I have developed an intense criminal record and I don't even remember it happening. I'm pretty sure if I were to try to go get an apartment right now, I could not get one. But I started getting arrested. But I'm so thankful that I got caught. You know, the Bible says that he disciplines those that he chastises, amen? And I look back and I see 
received the Lord, then he was on a rescue mission for my soul. Amen. He was on a rescue mission for your soul. He's on a rescue mission for the whore. Yes. But yet he would come for me. And I look back and I think to myself, I wasn't arrested. I was rescued. Amen. Yeah. Samuel 22 20 says I rescued you because I delighted in you Amen. that's for each one of us in this room tonight it is behind a divine sovereign creator's hands that you are sitting here tonight listening to whatever it is that's about to be said and you and I are gonna figure it out together because I'm not sure how it's gonna come out but I have a message for you and it's from this man it's his story and it's in Mark 5 and I'm going to read from Mark 5, verses 1 through 20. The girls heard this message last night at church. So sorry, not sorry. They get to hear it again. Right? I, uh, I'm a firm believer that repetition is the mother of all learning. So y'all say repetition is the mother of all learning. Amen. So whenever you leave here tonight or when you spend time with Jesus in the morning, I want you to go back to Mark 5. Say Mark 5. And I want you to read this man's story because there's a chance that the Lord will preach it to you even more so than what I'm about to. Amen. So let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this moment in history. God, I thank you for these people. And I just pray that you give me the words in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So Mark 5, it says, they went across the lake to the region of the Gerasenes. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs, y'all say tombs, tombs, tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. I'm gonna pause right there for just a second. If you have never read this story before, your mind is about to be blown that this would even be in the Bible. Amen. I should have given you a heads up, just real quick. I'm about to tell you a story about a man that was possessed by demons, lived in a cave, and would cut himself. You all received that well, great, okay. Also, uh, Jesus shows up and delivers him, amen. Amen. And he cast all the demons into pigs, yes. 2,000 of them, and those demons and drown. Yes. I'm not making this up. Right? Right? <laughs> Jesus put someone out of a job to save this dude. Right? Amen. It's like, Jesus, you got to put on a show. I'm just trying to get saved. No, he didn't just put someone out of a job. He put a whole family out of a job. 2,000 pigs, that's a lot of money. That is a lot of money. Anyways, this man, he's like, man, Jesus, I just want to follow you. And, and Jesus says, no, you got to go into the city. You gotta go into the city, and I'm gonna read you why. But just real quick, that sounds like a crazy story, and we're not gonna focus so much on the spiritual warfare aspect of it, whereas that is just as important. But don't think of it as spooky, don't think of it as weird. It's just the world, it's just reality. I just, I'm, I'm really not into focusing on that aspect of it, but it is what it is. So this man was possessed by demons, but this man was possessed by his issues, just like all of us have been. Because that's all that those things are. They're issues. Anger, lust, pride. They're issues. And we have a lifetime subscription to them. Amen. That's the magazine. Come on, you can laugh. Okay. So moving on, on verse 3. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. Do be strong. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. Oh. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him, he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me, for Jesus has said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? Before I move on, I want us to take a look at this for a second. 
If you didn't realize what just happened, I'm going to spell it out for you. Jesus showed up on the scene. Right. Yeah. This man has been trapped in those tombs, and for lack of better words, I'm going to say cave. This man has been stuck in these caves for years. In the second that Jesus shows up, everything on heaven and earth and everything under earth bows at him and comes. Do you realize that the demons that had possessed this man were pulled his body out of the cave and put him at Jesus' feet in that moment? That just goes to show that everything in the entire earth has to bow to him. Amen. And that just goes to show the amount of power that is in Jesus, the amount of authority that is in his presence. Yes. I just imagine his perfect little Jesus feet. You know what I mean? I'm, I always know to speak because I wear size 11 shoes. It's always been a self-like, self-conscious thing. So I just imagine that Jesus has these perfect feet. Okay. And the second that he steps off this boat and he puts his perfect little Jesus sandal on the sand, I just I just see this echo of authority that just goes throughout the land. Like the second that he steps on the scene, everything in heaven and on earth bows. Even your enemy will put you at Jesus' feet. Yes. Yes. What the yes. devil meant for bad, God means for good. Yes. Amen. Amen. And you may think to yourself, well, that's wild. Well, here's the thing. That same power that was in his tiny little toes is the same power that's in your toes. Yes. Because he was in the flesh then, but he's in you today. And the same power and the same authority that he walked in, you walk in today. So what did he do? He just said, then Jesus asked him, verse 9, what is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Y'all see the pigs? Making sure you're paying attention. Send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went to the pigs. The hurt. He was cute. He's cute. <laughs> okay. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. And I just imagine that Jesus is like, LOL. Like, that's funny. <laughs> like, he had to get a kick out of that. I'm sure God is, like, sitting up in heaven, and he's like, okay, I mean, I guess that's fine. You know what I mean? Because Jesus said, I came not to do anything, not my will, but the will of the yeah. Father. Amen. Amen. And it says, those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and the countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed, yeah. and in his right mind. Amen. 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 Y'all say right mind. Right. Of this story in other gospels that says that he would tear his clothes. I don't know if any of y'all have ever been arrested for public indecency, but that's when you hit the bottom. Okay? It says that in, he was in his right mind and they were afraid. They were afraid. It freaked them out. And then it says, those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. They're like, dude, you are crazy. Go to the caves and take that man with you. They were freaked out by Jesus. How many of you guys have been set free, turned to Jesus, and all your other folks were like, weirdo, you can go? <laughs> you get a little weird, and that's okay. Because Paul said, if I'm out of my mind, it is for Christ, right? Yeah. So we are odd for God. Yeah. So verse 18 says, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Yeah. And how he has had mercy on you. 
So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. Amen. 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 There will be a day for each of you that you will be called out of the cave. Yes. Amen. This man lived in the caves. Let's talk about caves for a second. What are caves? They are dark, they're damp, and they're dead. He lived in the caves. And those caves were becoming his grave. He, he was dying there. And many of us have lived in caves before. I know that I have lived in caves before. Like, we can talk about literal locations, like trap houses, you know, a certain apartment that you used to live in, that you used to do all your drugs in, like that definitely felt like a cave. But I dare to say that many of us have lived in caves inside of our hearts, that we've lived in caves inside of our minds. We've lived in caves as far as our habits and our lifestyles and our toxic relationships. Those have been caves, too. Yes. Amen. 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 Our caves were our graves. Isaiah 60, 5, 4 says that the people were sitting among the graves spending nights in secret places. I've been there. That kind of thing where you wake up and you don't know where you are. Right. But then you don't really care. Right. Type thing. This man was a caveman. And I can testify to the fact that I've been a cave woman. That's right. Oh, yeah. Amen. But the good news is, is that this Jesus guy that showed up, he called him out of the cave. Yeah. He called him out of the cave. And as he called him out of the cave, he invited him into the city. Remember, this man said, Jesus, let me go with you. Jesus said, no, son, you got to go into the city. Yeah. So let's look at that for a second. It says that he begged Jesus to go with him. And I really have a heart for this man. I always have. Whereas this man might freak some people out. He always makes me cry when I read his story. So while I was in Mexico, I just got back from Mexico. I was there for two weeks on a mission trip. While I was there, I read the book of Mark. And I also watched, when we had Wi-Fi, I also watched uh, the gospel according to Mark on YouTube. And if you have a chance, I want you to do that. It, go on YouTube, type in the gospel according to Mark. And type in LUMO Project, L-U-M-O Project. And these people have taken the book of Mark and they've turned it into a movie. And they don't say anything in that movie except scripture. So I fast forwarded to this, to this man's part. And when I watched it, it just it opened my eyes to just the, uh, to just the emotion behind this. So I'm going to paraphrase this Lexi style for you. So this man has been stuck in these caves for years, y'all. He has been he has been harming himself. Many of us may not have been physical cutters. I know some people that have. We've had girls that that's been a part of their testimony. But listen, if you were not physically cutting yourself, you in some way were damaging your life. Yeah. You know what I mean? And this man was stuck in these caves doing these things. And the second Jesus shows up, he falls at his feet and he gets set free. And I just see the disciples and Jesus and they're just all celebrating. Like this, this man, for the first time in years, has come to himself and can like think his own thoughts. So let's think about that for a second. Some of you have been so bad that you didn't even have the ability to think your own thoughts. I've been there. The Bible says that the enemy blinds the minds of unbelievers to where they can't even think for themselves. And in a split second, the power of God touched this man and he thought for himself. And in that moment, they're celebrating, they're celebrating. And this man is just so overwhelmed with the fact that these random folks would show up and care anything about him. And then before he knows it, he turns around and they're leaving. And they're walking back to the boat. And he's like, hey guys, wait up, wait up. So he, so he runs up and he, and he gets to the guys and, and he looks up to Jesus who has gotten back in the boat. And he says, let me go with you, Jesus. He says, let me go with you. And Jesus says, no, son, you can't come with us. And he says, please let me go with you. I want, I want to go with you, Jesus. 
and, and the Lord looks down on him and he, and he meets him in his eyes and he says, you can't come with us. You have to go into the city. And the, and the man who's been delivered, he says, but I can't go out there. I can't, I can't go into that city. I am embarrassed of what I've done. And I am ashamed of who I am. Don't make me face them, Jesus. And Jesus says, you go, you can do it, trust me. <laughs> and as he continues to plead with Jesus, no, please, they've heard me screaming from these caves for years. Please don't make me show my face. Jesus says, trust me. You have a city that has been destined for you. Amen. Yes. Yes. Son, I need you yeah. to walk out yeah. the call of God yeah. that is on your life. Yeah. And yes, you will encounter people that will reject you. And yes, you will encounter people that think that you're a fake. But you move on past them because I have a destiny. So I dare to say tonight, that there are some people in this room that are being called out of a cave because God has a city for you. So he was in a cave. What are caves? They're dark, they're dead, and they're damp. What is a city? It's full of life. It's full of light. It's full of people. You know, caves, they're lonely. They're lonely. But in cities, they're not lonely. You got people. You got family. You have church friends. In a city, you get to be a mom. You can't be a mom in the cave, y'all. Come on. Amen. Come on, sister. Amen. Come on, that's right, sister. You can't be a wife in the cave. Mm -hmm. You can try, but you know how that ends. Mm -hmm. In the city, you get to be a functional part of society. Amen. In the city, you get to do your thousand hours of community service to get that driver's license back. Amen. In the city, you get to go see that probation officer. In the city, you get to pay your fines. In the city, you get to get a job. The city is for you. Yes. yes. Listen, guys, you were never made for caves, right. and you were never made for graves. That's right. That wasn't for you. God never had that for you to begin with. But you know what? He came for you. Just like Jesus came for him, he came for you. Amen. Amen. There was no coincidence that Jesus showed up for this man. Do you realize that the only thing that he did in Gethsemane was encounter this man, and he left? That's no coincidence. The Lord will show up in the middle of the night, yeah. in the darkest places, yeah. to get you out. Yeah. 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 And you may say to yourself, well, all I've ever known is the caves. Right. My mama was a cave woman. <coughs> My grandmama was a cave woman. All I know are the caves. I'm being for real, y'all. This is my heart. Yeah. All I've ever known is cave language. Look at me. All I have are cave clothes. How are you going to expect me to go into the city when all I've ever known is the cave? Going into that city that God has for you, it will come with sacrifice. Yeah. It will come with sacrifice, yeah. but I am here tonight to encourage you that God will send you people. He will send you people yeah. because when you are adopted into the family of God, that means that there are people out there called laborers that get on their knees every morning and say, God, use me. And he will send you. I did that that myself. I came out of my cave and I went to the harbor home. That was the first city I encountered. And it was women of God who were teaching me how to be a woman. Amen. Amen. I went, I came out of the 
cave and I went into the city and I met Roy L. Clark and he taught me about integrity. Amen. I came out of the cave and I went into the city and I enrolled in Central Baptist College and I'm learning all things of the city. Amen. You get what I'm saying? Amen. Like when you come out of that cave, there's a chance that there's going to be a journey into the city that yeah. you're going to be lonely. And there's going to be moments where you're going to want to turn around and go back to the cave because that is more familiar, that is more comfortable, and that is all you've ever known. That's but right. if you will put one foot in front of the other, and I don't just mean people that want to help you I mean people that need you Amen. you have a story you have a testimony you have an anointing you have a power on your life that only certain people can Walk out. There is something on your life that you have destined to do that I cannot do. You have certain gifts. You have certain abilities that I can never have. And I am counting on you to do what you were called to do. I used to say that one day my granddaughter is going to need something for her soul that I can't give her. I am counting on you to walk out the call of God on your life so that she can get what she needs. Amen. city that are waiting for you. There is someone that you're going to run into Walmart. You're going to go into Walmart. You're going to run into someone in six months and they're going to say, I'm so glad I ran into you because I needed to hear exactly what you just said. Amen. Listen, you don't have to be behind a mic in order to fulfill the call of God on your life. If you will just stay in the will of God, he will position you where you are needed most. There are people that are counting on you to go into that city because they need to hear the reason for the hope in you. Amen. They need to know. And by golly, you may just need to run into them at the gas station and they may need to see you sober. And that in, in itself could get them yes. to change. Amen. Amen. that you will ever preach is your changed lifestyle. Yeah. There's only so much I can say without me actually doing it. You have to practice what you preach and the loudest message that you can ever give is to walk out the call of God in your life. It's to walk out what you were destined for, as Jenna was saying. She was saying the, the point of me going to the Harbor Home wasn't just to get Jenna back to the Jenna before drugs. The point of the Harbor Home, the point of Christ, the point of deliverance, the point of Jesus showing up on this scene was not to just get this man back to where he was before the caves. The point of Jesus showing up on this scene was to get this man back to where he originally destined him to be in that city. Amen? Because here's the thing, that man could have stayed among the caves. <clears throat> Follow me with this analogy for just a second. We can stay among the caves if we want to without going inside them. This man had options when Jesus left. He said, all right, Jesus is gone. Let's, let's just hang out. Let's just stay around the caves. You know, Jesus is gone, turn up, party at the cave, you know what I mean? <laughs> My house type thing. He could have done anything that he wanted to do. He could have lingered around the caves, you know what I mean? Because it's familiar and it's safe to him. He doesn't have to be challenged at the caves. It's easy, it's comfortable. Everyone there already knows him, you know what I mean? You can be sober and you can be clean and hang out amongst the same friends or the same the same spots that you were in, but only for so long, y'all. Right. Because right. here's the deal. Amen. If I go back to the caves, if I go back to those same houses, those same people, if I go back to those same places, now granted, there are some of you that are called to stay in the same city that you got in your, got into your mess in, okay? Here's the deal. Cersei was the darkest city that I ever experienced, but God sent me back there nine months after I graduated the harbor. So God may keep you in that city, but here's the thing. If you continue to hang around the same people, the same places, and do the same activities, even without getting high, 
there's a chance that if you go back to that cave, eventually yeah. they are going to mistake you for a caveman. That's and they're going to invite you back in. That's right. You got on the same clothes. You look the same. You act the same. Sure, you're clean, but maybe you just ain't got any. You know what I mean? Like, eventually, they're going to mistake you for a cave woman. Yeah. They're going to invite you back in. And here's the deal. This is me being just completely honest. My personality is that that I avoid confrontation at all costs. Yes, it is an area in my life that the Lord is working on. But I want to be friendly to people. I want, I want everyone to just be in harmony and balance and everyone to be happy and pleased. And here's the deal. If I was, if I was around the caves and someone invited me in, it would be hard for me to say no. Come on. Come on. I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want them to think that, oh, I'm clean now. I'm better than you, so I can't go in there, you know. I've heard people, they've said you're holier than thou. And what it is is it's just, it's a, it's a confusion thing. And oftentimes when people are still in their mess, they, they feel convicted when they're around you because their hearts know that you have something that they need. And they will misunderstand it and misjudge it to be judgment when in actuality your heart is pure. But here's the thing, they might invite me into the cave and I, and I say, okay, just for water, just for water. Mm -hmm. and, and that will only last so long, guys. Mm -hmm. It'll only last so long. Yeah. Here's the deal, God forced this man to face his fears and it brought him more freedom. Mm -hmm. God forced this man to face his fears as easy as it would be to stay among the caves and to live that cave-like lifestyle. God forced this man to go into the city and face his fears. He didn't want to face the people. He didn't want to face that old boss. He didn't want to face that old school teacher. He didn't want to face that parole officer. He didn't want to face that bail bondsman. He did not want to face the people. He didn't want to face the mother-in-law, the father-in-law. And I just imagine when I when I play this story out in my head, I I um I just I, I see this man and he's in the caves and the scripture says that he would cry out like ah he would cry out and say say he had kids say he had a wife and say his kids are are coming home from school and they're walking home with their friends and. And all of a sudden, they hear this cry out, and everyone looks around, and 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 the kid goes, "That's that that's my dad. I'm sorry, that's that's my dad." You know, and I just imagine the the humility that this man was afraid to afraid to to walk through. I imagine that he had a mom that would come after him. Y'all know those mamas that would get up in those hills and climb up in those caves and, and do it for you? You know what I mean? And the scriptures literally say that people would go up in the hills and try and shame them himself. I don't know about you, but I've had interventions where my family is literally trying to chain me down. And before they know it, I've already broken my old chains and I am back to my old ways. Like, they could only hold me down for so long. Does that make sense? This man broke his own chains. That means that there was someone that cared enough to go up there and try to chain him down and slow him down and calm him down and get him to get right in his head again. But he broke his own chains and he kept going. And I just imagine that the mom, the wife, the kids, the old school teacher that had hope for you, I imagine that as they hear you cry from the caves, that they feel helpless. Because there's nothing they can do. They tried, they tried to, they tried to chain him down. They tried to save him. And these people, they have to live with the agony of listening to you suffer, knowing that there's nothing that they can do. This was me. He is me. I see myself in these scriptures. My mom watched me break my life. 
My family watched me suffer. I imagine I'll never forget I was, I was going into another psych ward and my mom and stepdad were going on a cruise that same week. They didn't plan on me to try to take my life before they went on vacation. And when I called her from the hospital, I said, please just get on that boat and go. Just go. Don't worry about me. Just go. My mom heard me screaming from the cave the whole time she was on that cruise. Our families will hear us scream from the cave. I'm just trying to give you perspective because I love you. And there are people in this room that are having to listen to those screams right now. And I'm also here to give you hope. Because as much as you want to chain him down, and as much as you want to save him, you can't. There was one man that was able to. Amen. Who was it? Amen. It was Jesus. Amen. I once heard someone say, I cannot be your Christ. If you have someone out there now that is lost and broken, that, has, that is like the waves of the sea, they're in and they're out. They're in and they're out. I am here to give you peace. I am here to encourage you Amen. and give you hope that that is not your responsibility yeah, to right. save them. That yeah. is not your responsibility to rescue them. Yeah. You were made to be rescued. You were not made to be the rescuer. Amen. Amen. You cannot be yeah. someone's Christ. There was only one man yes. that died on the cross for That's that person right. that you love. Amen. There was only Amen. one man that rose from the grave for that person that you love. Yes. And what's crazy is I know that some of you love your people so much that you would probably do it yourself. But you know what? That's not your job. That was his job. That's right. Let the Lord be the Lord. Amen. 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 Cut yourself a break and get some sleep. Let the Lord be the Lord. Amen. Okay? Amen. So another point I want to give you is, all, yes, it was a struggle for this man to, to come out of the caves and to go into the city. And yes, God supernaturally, supernaturally means that we don't have anything to do with it, That's but right. we just show up and it happens. Yeah. And, in, and in actuality, we don't even show up. He shows up, right? He shows up. I want you to keep in mind that the like geography here, like dude never dude never left. Jesus showed up. Amen. And he got delivered. So delivered means that you're set free. That means that your issues leave you in the power of the name of Jesus. Right? Yes. And then what happens is you're faced with this, uh, with this sort of journey of freedom. This freedom journey. Because being delivered is something that happens then. Walking in freedom is a process. Okay, yes. And this man was supernaturally delivered of his issues, but I want you to take notice to the fact that it was in his own free will, yes. with his own two feet, yes. that he walked into that city. Amen. And this city that you know that God has called you to, this city with peace and freedom and purpose and restoration, this city that you know that God has called you to in your heart and in your mind, God's not just going to pull you up in the clouds and supernaturally place you there. As much as I want that for myself, like, Jesus, why can't you just do it for me? Why can't I just wake up and our reality changes? As much as you want that, that's not going to happen. It is you and it is your own two feet that have to take you into that city. Amen. Amen. It's your own two feet. Amen. I wrote here that God set him free from the caves, but it was his own choice yes. to go into the city. Woo! Amen. Right. Good choice is laid right here. Yes. It took his own two feet yeah. and his own free will to yeah. march on into that city and show his face and be seen. And yeah. let me tell you this right now. If you've never heard of this lady, her name is Benet Brown, and she is this researcher on shame and guilt. And, um, and through her research, she found that showing up is half the battle. Literally, that place, that, that moment that you have so much anxiety over, that fear, that humiliation, if you'll just show up, I promise, it'll just all work out. Showing up is half the battle. Amen. Amen. Showing up is half the battle. And like I told you, you were never made for caves. You were never made for graves. 
You were never meant to die. You were never meant to die spiritually. You were never meant to die emotionally. You were never meant to die relationally. But here is the thing. God is a redeemer. He is a restorer. And there is no sin that you have committed. There is no loss that you have encountered that the power of God cannot overwhelm. Because here is the thing. His grace, y'all say grace. His grace is so much bigger than our mistakes. You think problems, they are nothing in comparison to the blood that he shed on the cross. Amen. Don't think that you are such a big deal that your issues cannot be covered by the blood. Yeah. Please understand that he died on the cross for me, he died on the cross for you. He did it for me, he did it for you. Regardless of what you've seen, what you've done, or who you have hurt. Regardless of who you have heard screaming from the caves, or regardless of who you listen to right now, the cross is big enough. <laughs> and I love this here because an interesting fact to this story, are you with me? Yeah, yeah. I've got a few more things for you. An interesting thing about this story is that when God called him out of the caves, he didn't just invite him into a city. The city that he invited him to was actually called the Decapolis. And if you're familiar with the, that geography, the Decapolis is actually made up of 10 cities. So I'm a firm believer that for every one cave that you give up, God wants to give you 10 cities. That for every one thing, for every one thing that you surrender, he wants to give you so much more in return. Because that is the God that we serve. Ephesians 3.20, for my God can do far more than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. Amen. Amen. He's not some sort of like person that makes deals. He's not some person that is equal. He's not some person that gives you that gives you a a piece of monetary equipment in exchange for money. Like our God is not equal. I mean, yes, he is a God of justice, but what he gives you is far bigger than what you give up. Amen. Yes. Amen. I'm gonna say it again. What he gives you is so much bigger than what you give up. picture on Facebook where this little girl is holding like this tiny little teddy bear. Yes. And and y'all have seen it. And uh, so she's holding this tiny little teddy bear and, and Jesus is standing in front of her and he says, give it to me. And you know, you know us, we're like, why you always got to take away God? And, um, and he's like, give it to me. And she doesn't want to. You know, she's afraid to give it up. But little does she know that behind Jesus' back is holding a way bigger teddy bear. And he wants to give that in place of the small one. Amen. Amen. There may be some people in that cave that you think that you can't live without. Don't think that I don't recognize the, the fact that, that you leaving that cave comes with pain because there's people in that cave that you probably love. Yeah. I know. And there's, there's this thing psychologically, it's called bonding through suffering. And there's this thing that happens in you that when, when you... When you survive with someone, when you when you lie with someone, when you manipulate with someone, when that person is alongside you, there's this like suffering, there's this bonding through suffering that's built in the back of your mind. And to you, that's called loyalty, sort of. And it's a twisted sense of loyalty because you're doing like ungodly things. But that's like the most closeness or the most, um, the most connection that you're experiencing at the time without Christ in your life. Right. And in a sense, that's where codependency takes place. That's where toxic relationships happen. And you say, Lord, please don't, please don't make me leave the cave. Like, he's in there. Why won't you get him too? You know, I get it. I know that going into that city comes with pain. I know that it comes with sacrifice. But please know that the Lord sees that. 
And he's going to honor that. Amen. Because he sees that your sacrifice is probably far greater than the norm. It's one thing for you to leave the cave by yourself. It's another thing to leave all them behind you. But I'm here to tell you today that as soon as you go into that city, you will find that God has new people for you. Yes. Amen. Yes. And for every one caveman that you left behind, God has ten city slickers for you. Yes.
And some of us have probably said some things out of place that we're ashamed of. But here's the thing. If this man went into that city, then you can too. You can too. So let's everyone bow your heads. We're going to pray. And if you have ever believed in God, I'm talking about some true, real belief. I'm talking about that soul belief. I'm talking about, like, Jesus, this is real. If you have ever believed in God, in this moment, I want you to believe. The Word says, God, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. So in your hearts now, in this moment, I just, I just want you to center yourself in God's love. And I want you to truly connect with your heart right now. Don't put up walls. Like, let yourself be free right now. And let yourself feel whatever it is that you feel. So, Father, I just thank you so much for these people, God. I thank you for my family. Lord, I thank you that no matter where we've been, God, no matter what cave it is, that you always come. God, I thank you that you come to the darkest places in our life. Lord, I thank you that you come and you pull us out of those places that we think that we've hidden so safely in. Lord, I know there's people in this room today that they are so far deep inside of a cave that they can barely see the light. And Lord, I just, I pray for those people, Lord, the ones that are wanting to walk out of the cave of addiction, the ones that are walk, wanting to walk out of the cave of abuse, the ones that are wanting to walk out of the cave of, of pride, the ones that are wanting to walk out of the cave of lust, Lord, I pray for each person, God, I pray that you pull their spirits out by the power of Jesus, God, and I pray that you touch our lives and you set us free like you set this man free here, God. Lord, we're asking, we're asking as sons and daughters. Lord, I pray that you touch their minds so that they'll be in their right mind. I break off depression in the name of Jesus. I break off anxiety in the name of Jesus. I break off fear in the name of Jesus. Fear you have no place here among your people. Father, I thank you that we've not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. God, I thank you that it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. So, Lord, I just, I pray that over each person, God. I pray a blessing over their family, their finances, God. I pray a blessing over their minds, over their careers, over their jobs, Lord, over their homes. Father, I thank you that as for me and my house, we serve the Lord. Yes. Father, I pray for safe travels as they go home, Lord. I pray that you speak to them tonight as they go to bed, and I pray that you speak to them in the morning as they wake up. And I pray protection over them, that surely those who dwell in the shelter of the Most High will rest. In the shadow of the Almighty. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
Tell the girls. We really appreciate uh, the Harbor Home coming and sharing tonight. Girls, y'all did an awesome job, awesome, awesome job. That's our God. All right. Call, call your prayer out to God. Man, he is here. The presence of God is here. He's hearing everything that you got to say. Robert, welcome home. Welcome home, Robert. Yes. Thank you for being here with us tonight. And, and, and I'm telling you, I know where he lives, so you better stop. Hey, Robert, she tells me that all the time. So I'm telling you. Temptation. He's here every week. He knows. <laughs> call your prayer out, guys. Just call it out to God, whatever you want. I'm pretty sure for it. Um, no, no, I'm going to pray for my husband. He made parole. Thank you, Lord. He'll be home in, at the, in August. So just um, learn the thing of his trip. Amen. And when we get out that cave. Amen. Amen. Ian and Landon and Taylor. 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 Yeah. I passed away two days ago. I'm praying for my daughter and my son to come out of addiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, people look at you like you got it going on, man. You got no, no. I'm not going to be happy until everybody I know comes out of it. Amen. 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 And you know, the only way you're going to come out of it is Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only way. That sign out there, we, it has been our staple from day one. Jesus is the cure. That's there right. is no other answer. If Amen. it was, I would have found it 45 years before coming to him. Yes. But when I surrendered it, he is the cure. Yes. Amen. Amen. No other. Jesus. Amen. Him alone. Amen. Lord, I want to pray for me. Please uh, pray for me to learn to be the mother, because y'all know I got my kids back, so let me be the mama I'm supposed to be, and uh, don't beat them while they're at home. <laughs> <laughs> surgery a couple of days ago, so yeah. uh, wants to pray for him too and his recovery. Yeah. Amen. Just had serious surgery. I want to keep my brother and my sister in my prayers because uh, they're been in recovery for, I don't know exactly how long, I know my brother has been in recovery for about a year, and I want to keep them in prayer because I want them to stay that Amen. way. At least that I know that they're doing well for themselves. You know, I've, I've watched them in it and I've watched them out of it, and it, I felt helpless, you know. And so I'm so happy now. I just want to keep them in my prayers, honestly. Amen. Um, I've got a praise report. I just want to thank God for the Lord for healing my brother. Yes. Yes. Not a new 
down on the enemy's neck, he's screaming all wet. The big covered in the blood with his head. Father, we thank you so much, especially for the move of the Holy Spirit among us this evening. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you still visit your people. You minister to our needs. Thank you for Alexi, and thank you for what we've heard this evening, and the mouthpiece she is for you. We pray that you will continue to work in her life, in the various ministries that are serving you faithfully and loyally. We thank you for David and Chrissy's house. We thank you for their ministry here, and we pray that more of these places can be birthed throughout our communities in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.